Hello and welcome to the Investing on the Go podcast brought to you by Fund Calibre. I'm Ryan Lightfoot-Brown and I'm joined today by Dean Tenerelli, the elite rated manager of the T. Rowe Price Continental European Equity Fund. Dean, thank you for joining us. Thank you. Um, what sort of impact has the US-China trade war had on Europe? I mean, the trade wars had a very significant impact on Europe and in the global economy. Europe, in particular, is a very open economy, especially in Germany, um, where 50% of the of the GDP is is exports. But even the UK, where it's actually over 50, uh, 50%. Um, so, world trade and you know the, the the ability of companies to be able to ma- manufacture in one country and and ship their um, you know sub sub components to other countries and assemble in other countries has been a really um, Big important growth driver, both for well for the industrialization of China, but also for um, lowering costs in Europe and being more efficient in the supply chain and bringing the cost of um, products down. That has caused, or the slowdown has caused, um, uh, a big um, slowdown in Germany. We've had an industrial recession last year, which began sort of mid-year, and you could see that through the PMIs, which um, sort of declined precipitously last year, and I and and really haven't recovered since. So. Europe, in general, we are still in an industrial slowdown. Obviously, China needs to recover for this um, phenomena to recover. And also, any trade deal, when it is finalized, will also help the situation and try to make, um, and it should make, um, the situation better. Hmm. And do you think this slowdown could lead to a full, full-blown full recession in Europe? It certainly could lead. Um, there's no signs of the fact that it is bleeding over into the service sector or into consumption yet. And that would be the other important thing to see. But in fact, um, several central bank heads have co- co- you know, commented on the fact that this has not happened yet, but it's likely that it would. And there's only so long that the economy can resist without it. But right now, it's very much centered in, uh, in, in the industrial portion of the economy, although that could change. I have to say, it doesn't feel like it's changing. And the results season that we just had in Q1 um, was actually quite good. So there were a lot of beats, um, beats out, out, out did misses in Europe. On lowered expectations, true, but um, still a decent earnings season. So it doesn't feel like um, the rest of the economy is worsening at all. Okay. And you're primarily a sort of bottom-up stock picker. Um, is there any sort of positioning in your portfolio to try and mitigate these risks? We don't think in terms of trends or um, you know top-down themes to, to adjust positions in the strategy, but we would pick it up through um, companies that have gotten cheap. So. Because there's an industrial recession, certain companies in Germany had come down a lot. One of them was Kian, um, which I bought. Kian is, um, um, they make forklift trucks and they are um, sort of a, um, a manager of uh, warehouses. Mm-hmm. So obviously the, the, the trend of growth in warehousing needs due to Amazon and online retailing is huge around the world and Europe is, you know, is the same. And Kian is a company that provides software to manage better your warehouse and also provides the equipment to do that. That got really cheap just because of the sell-off in Germany and because industrial production doubts about CapEx going forward. So I did take a position in Kion. So we tend to pick up you know, those kind of themes through bottom-up valuations that change. Sure. And uh, some of your largest holdings are Swiss companies. Is there a particular reason for the preference there? Uh, no, not really. Um, in fact, most of the Swiss holdings, or all of the Swiss holdings, are, in this case, pharmaceutical companies. Yeah. Um, well, it's no secret that Switzerland has a lot of good quality listed pharmaceutical companies, and we own uh, a lot of them. Um, so, uh, so why the preference for pharmaceutical companies then? Uh, well, I think pharma got very cheap in 2017, 2018 because of uh, the doubts about drug pricing in the United States. Um, the U.S. is going through a very um, deflationary period in drug prices. You have a lot of the large purchasers like the HMOs and insurance companies really hitting the pharmaceutical companies hard on drug prices and trying to get their costs down um, in the system. It's also been a focus of different governments over the last year. So there is a big push in the U.S. That sort of drove um, the pharma stocks down. And in fact, it is a realistic thing. You can see this, you know, pricing pressure within uh, the earnings of the companies. The problem is that they got, or the, the opportunity was, they got companies that sold off a lot and they got very, very cheap. And you have owned a number of technology companies in the portfolio. Technology is not usually a sector we associate with Europe. It's more of a, known as a big American phenomenon. Mm-hmm. Um, can you tell us a bit more about what holdings you had and where Europe does well in this area? I think there, well, I think in Europe, um, for, for tech, as we say, um, obviously we have ASML, which is a, a leader in semiconductors. So that's sort of one area which I still do own. Um, and we have a couple semiconductor companies in Europe. I, ASML certainly is 
market leading, technological leading, and just top of top of the game. Additionally, there's a bunch of software companies that are listed in Europe. Some of them are mid cap, some of them are large cap. I mean, everyone knows SAP. Um, I owned SAP, you know, several years ago. I sold it on valuation um, purposes. Um, and I owned a company called SimCorp, which is sort of a mid-cap company that provides um, software for the fund management industry. A great business, dominant in Europe with very little market share in the U.S., and they're gaining market share in the U.S. now. So um, that's a very good company. Also, that got very expensive. I sold it. In general, I would say valuations for me in, 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 in the tech stocks that we do have in Europe are not very interesting. Um, they're expensive. Um, so I have been reducing, and, and the only ones I do on now is still SM, ASML, which is getting there on the price target, and um, also Capgemini, which is a consultant, yeah. which is a bit cheaper in valuation. Um, obviously, not, not as I would say not a, a great story like some of the software companies might be, but still, still reasonable and still benefits from all of the trends. Sure. So some of the companies we've touched on before have been sort of the large ones, but actually in the portfolio you've got a mid-cap bias. What is it about that sort of area, part of the market that you like so much? Um, we've, you know, I've always had a bias towards mid-caps, you know, and sometimes it ranges from 10% to 20% of the portfolio. So it's not in any way a mid-cap fund, but we do like to get involved in mid-cap. I mean, I'm looking for basically good businesses with great returns, mm. um, strong barriers to entry, and wherever I find that, I will invest in it. I have to say, of late, um, a lot of my newer ideas have been mid-caps, um, and I'm not exactly sure why. I mean, I take the opportunities as they come, but we've been buying things like Auto Supplier. Um, this Kian I mentioned is actually mid-cap, Husvarna, which is... Um, a consumer garden, garden and lawnmower company based in Sweden, um, Viralia, which is a new IPO a year ago, um, which is a bottle manufacturer. All of these have been sort of mid caps. I'm just sort of wondering: is this a phenomenon of sort of large ETFs and basket trading pushing up certain segments of the market and leaving these mid caps behind? It's a question I don't know the answer to that. And then the other thing could actually be Mifid too, because a lot of this stuff is not getting the focus of brokers anymore and are uncovered. Um, but in any event, we'll take the opportunities as they come, and, and, and they are good businesses. They throw off a lot of cash, so they will get re-rated at some point. Mm. So um, we find a lot of opportunities now there. Yeah. And one word I've um, hear you mention quite a lot is valuations. What sort of areas of the market are you looking at sort of as good value at the moment? And we've obviously talked about the expensive areas, but what's good? Um, I think the market in general is, is you know, pretty pretty fairly valued. Um, when you look at it internationally and other developed markets, I think Europe does stand out as being the cheaper one. Um, we certainly have seen more interest in Europe over the last six months, I would say, because of that. Um, so, But within that, um, there are big disparities. I think a lot of the defensive sectors that people were hugging up to, like you know, consumer, consumer beverages or food, um, these companies tend to be very expensive. Luxury goods, very expensive. Some of the old... Um, I would say quanti I call them quantitative easing stocks that have benefit from negative interest rates and people have sort of hid there for safety. I find extremely expensive. I think where you find more opportunities is in more um, stuff that's sold off because of fear about China slowdown. So particularly the auto sector, we've been very active looking at some of the suppliers in the auto sector. And Europe has a great auto supply um, industry. Um, you know, because we have good OEMs and demanding OEMs, um, the subsuppliers have been great on technology. They're growing a lot in China. They don't necessarily suffer from the change to electric vehicles from combustion engines. So there, 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 there's some really good stories that we've been spending a lot of time looking at, at those. And what's your, with that in mind, what is your outlook for European markets this year? Is Brexit still a, a headline or a concern at all? <laughs> Well, the, the, the opening gun has been fired from Boris Johnson and the negotiating team, I would say, uh, this week, um, certainly starting on the very extreme position, and, and then Europe has to answer with the same thing. Um, so we have to see how, how that develops. You know, um, I think within, I think Brexit is very relevant. Um, I think within the Tory party, there's a big range of wanted outcomes, and so it's kind of difficult to predict. And I don't think a lot of this is being done on economic, rational basis. It's more political and emotional basis. So that makes it even harder to predict. Um, but somehow in all of this, I start to believe that having watched Boris and the team negotiating in the past, he often starts very radically and then sort of moves in line. So, and it is certainly Europe's nature to cut everything in half and meet in the middle. 
Um, I think that's been Angela Merkel, who may be on her way out, but that's been sort of German politics for the last 15 years, I would say. So I do think that a deal will, will be struck that will be reasonable for, for both sides. And um, so I think we'll get through that hurdle, but it might be noisy. Overall, I think the EPS in Europe should grow, I don't know, between 5 and 10% this year, probably closer to 5 Mm-hmm. Um, which isn't great, but it's not bad either. And I don't think there's going to be a recession overall. And valuations, I don't think there'll be much re-rating in, in terms of um, PEs. So I would say that the market should be in that sort of range. Highlight this, that in Europe, you have really good dividend yields. I mean, you have banks that are yielding 8% in Europe. There are stocks that are, are you know, have, have a really good payout. And so I think you should look at total return as well when you're considering you know, um, what some of these investments can provide. Sure. Dean, that's been really interesting. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much. And for more information on the T. Rowe Price Continental European Equity Fund, which is elite rated by Fund Calibre, please visit our website, fundcalibre.com. Please remember, we've been discussing individual stocks to bring investing to life for you. It is not a recommendation to buy or sell. The fund may or may not be holding these stocks at time of your listening.